Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Rising Frequencies. Today is November 8th, 2021, and I am here with Zakulu Ish Balong. And she's a white jaguar woman, and she's my friend Ginger. Ginger and I have been friends for about 20 years. And uh, she was a guest when we had Master Zayi, her, her counterpart. Um, but we could not hear Ginger. So she was so quiet and so soft-spoken. Finally, I had, I had several people, you know, write to me and say, it was a wonderful show. I loved, I loved hearing uh, Master Zayid, but I, I wanted to hear more from Ginger and I couldn't hear her. And then not only that, it wasn't just the second show. It was also the first show that we couldn't hear her. So I said, that's it. We're going to do a show where it's just you and me. So, so your voice can be heard. She's sitting where Master was sitting. I don't know if it's something with my, um, with my audio or if she was just too soft spoken that day. So welcome. Thank you so much for having us. So I want to really get into your, your lineage, how you were recognized, which I actually got to play a part in. And it, it was quite unique. I remember that you were looking for a class and then you happened to find a uh, master and it was in another state. And so can you, can you start there? And then when I come into the picture, I'll, I'll tell my part of the story. Sure, sure. So um, from the beginning, uh, I've always been a seeker and it has taken, taken us on quite a journey. Um, and at that juncture, I was about to turn 50 years old. And in many cultures, when a woman is going through that transitional period of the life, um, that is when she's coming into her full power. Uh, many times her responsibilities with family have changed, uh, her life is changing in many, many ways. And there's a blossoming that occurs that isn't recognized a whole lot in Western culture. Often we are taught to think that, you know, it's all about the youth and that's wonderful also, but there is a blossoming when it comes to aging. And all of the work, all of the exploration and education that I had had leading up to that point had brought me to the conclusion that it was all a preparation for what was to come. And one of the teachers that I was missing, at least in part, um, coming from a family that does have some indigenous history, and having a mother that is involved in spiritual matters, healing and things like that. Uh, but I did not have uh, a dedicated indigenous teacher. And I had been guided to uh, visit the Mayan world a couple of times, uh, right around this age 50 mark. And I kept putting out this inquiry during my prayer time, where, why do you keep sending me to the Mayan world? And where is my teacher? I am ready. I mean, we are told to be very specific when we are asking, to ask for what we need. And uh, that's also, that's also a great teaching um, of, of Master Saeed. Ask for what you need, not for what you want, and work on the discernment of that. And I felt that that was what was needed and that was what was next. Consequently, I was uh, looking at a friend's social media page. Someone who is in the yoga community, makes music, things like that. And they happen to be friends with Master. Um, when I saw his name, it struck a chord with me. My friend had posted something, reposted something of Masters. 
And I was very inquisitive about it. And when I clicked on it and I saw a picture of four people on his page, I knew, of course, instantly which one he was. And he seemed very familiar to me. Long story short, he had spent quite some time uh, in this area where we are living now in Pennsylvania and uh, somewhat traveling back and forth to his family in Kansas. He was not in this area when I reached out to him initially. I thought, my goodness, uh, a Mayan professor of science and religion, this has got to be it. And right under my nose, like, what's the likelihood of that? <laughs> and, you know, these are the kinds of things that we need to pay attention to. You know, these are our signs. And so when I reached out to him, he was like, oh, my dear, I am not there. However, he began asking me questions as well. And we decided that we were going to explore a little bit about um, what it was that I was interested in and why. And in the course of that sharing, certain things were revealed about me that he was able to share with the elders. So that put up some flags. Um, they are not only able to uh, sense our vibration. Now, these are not just elders in the etheric. These are elders that are here on this earth plane as well. Um, not only sense vibration of the heart and see things in the field, as you are familiar with that whole process. Um, but there are also things concretely with us physically that are able to be seen. It depends where and how you look. Um, and through that process, which took some time, they were able to discern pretty distinctly who and what I was. When Master was quite young, he was told that he had a counterpart. He was even shown a hologram of me by Master Damatik when he was in the Mayan world at one time. He was quite young. I want to say he was something like 11. But he remembers this. So there were things throughout his life that were clues to help him um, to try to find me. <laughs> and interestingly enough, I found him. Uh, we have been living quite close together at one point. Um, and even though our paths actually crossed at one time, uh, I could have initiated contact with him, but I did not. I was not having a very social day. I wasn't feeling quite myself that day. And so I did not have an interaction with him at that time. But I remembered it after I had met him uh, in the flesh, so to speak. So I did eventually travel. Uh, I arrived on the 18th of September, one day well, before well, turning 50. Now, I have to back up. But before you left, you came to me. Well, I did. There was a lot of discernment that went yes. into this. Uh, I was working uh, in several different capacities. I had, um, I had a pretty busy schedule, a lot of responsibility, and also uh, being independent and a world traveler, I still was not going to go and sit with someone, you know, journey myself, if I was not feeling as though this was going to be worth my time, that it was going to be safe, and so on and so forth. And when something is of utmost importance, basically, I knew that this could affect the rest of my life. Um, I reached out to you. Um, you are not the only person I reached out to, but concretely and in this area, it was, you know, it was kind of um, an insurance. It's like, okay, let's tap into all of this with your help, Lisa, and see what is revealed through all of that. And then you can speak yeah. about that process. Yeah, a bit. because then Ginger just basically says, you know, I, I found this teacher and they think that I am the the head female of the Jaguar lineage. 
<laughs> and you know, this is not something that your friend comes to you with. You know, <laughs> it's not an everyday occurrence. It's not an everyday occurrence. And I had to say, can you say that again? Because, you know, I, I didn't understand, you know, how the Mayan culture worked. I didn't know about the lineages. So she's explained this to me. And <clears throat> I didn't know what to think at first. I was scared because then she kind of told me, she said, well, based on when, based on your divinations, this is going to help me decide if I go. And I'm like, okay, great. So, you know, Ginger's one of my best friends. She's one of my longest friends. And here she wants me to do divination for her to determine whether she should go with these people that she's never met before. And they think she's the, the head of their lineage. You know, what if I'm wrong? What if I send my friend there and bad things happen to her and it's my karma, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I, you know, that's, that's a divinator's nightmare. It really is. And so I said, okay. You know, so I was very, very serious. I'm looking at her field. I'm feeling her heart. And so I, you know, I, I did the tarot cards. I, I did everything that I, that I knew with divination to, to come up. And every, every single thing I did came up. A yes, a yes, a yes. There was like no doubt. And so I'm like, okay, based on everything, I, I think I'm like, I think you're the real deal. I think you are who, who they think you are. They, they know you are that, and I feel that you are that. I think you should go. Um, and then I actually took it further. Can I talk about that? Sure. <clears throat> okay. Where, you know, we have, we have the medicine Buddha. And, you know, a, a, a Buddha, you know, is, is someone who has reached enlightenment. And, and it, it, it's an aspect of, of, of something higher. But they always have a consort, like the, the the main the main energy of that. Whether it doesn't matter in what family of Buddhism it is, you know. But uh, particularly, I was tapping into her her Tibetan lineage that she happened to be studying at the time. She's very very close to her teacher, who is a Tukul, and who she had past lives with, also as his counterpart. So I can feel that in her lineage, which is Nima. Was it Nima? Well, it is. It's it's Vajrayana, and mm -hmm. also that was that was part of the issue because, of course, you know we we honor the Tulku, and and you know we had been a student for for some time, and very much wished to study more in depth, mm -hmm. and uh, he had been asking for us. Yeah. However, both things were happening concurrently, and I had to weigh this. Had to I had to choose. And of course, um, you're speaking about the medicine Buddha. I had had all five levels of empowerment for the medicine Buddha through Tokula. And, um, you know, that was a, a great, <laughs> a, a great way in to, to some of these things, but it was, it was quite a large yeah. undertaking. So what I could see her as the consort of the medicine Buddha in her tradition, which she has not been recognized as. So I have no proof other than I was right about the Jaguar lineage. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm right about this too, but you know, so then she, you know, I had to choose is she, you know, she, if she would have chose the Tibetan route, chances are she would have not gotten any recognition because she is a Tukul. Um, but she probably would not have gotten that recognition because she's a Western woman. Chances are against you. So, you know, she had to choose whether, you know, to, to go with her, her Tibetan teacher or if she should go the Mayan route. So, and I wasn't telling her which one to pick, but I told her, I said, you need, you need to, you need to write back to both. So she, she went to Master Zayik and then I'll let her tell that story and everything. But then I also said, you have to write Tukula. You have to write to him and you have to be bold and tell him what I said, you know? And so she did. And so she told him, you know, that I feel that I have, you know, the, the, the consort of, of the medicine Buddha energy within me and, you know, what should I do? Where do we go from now? Can you confirm this? And so he basically just said, you need to come out to L LA for some time and meditate. That's all he said. So 
that kind of hit a dead end. <laughs> so then she went out to what state was it? It was Kansas. So However, she went out to Kansas. I do have to say that um, <clears throat> in our Vajrayana lineage, uh, Pena Rinpoche, who was the head of our lineage and who uh, to whom um, the Tolku is, was a hard son, uh, and remains so, of course, because that never, never goes away, was very, very instrumental in recognizing Western women and putting them in those positions. So no, you didn't know that. And I did not tell you. Uh, and consequently, the Tolku was also very much that way. So it was quite an accessible thing. And I very much thought that that was going to be the lineage that I would really get into, um, you know, some depth with. Also, you did have Tolku do this divination and it took some time and he did not write back right away because it took some time. And I don't know who all he was conferring conferring with as well, but I did not receive a response to him until after I had already traveled to master. So you, you know the response of the divination? He didn't, he didn't say outright. He was just like, you need to come and stay yeah. for some time yeah. uh, with me in, you know, in, in my, right. Well, then you probably would have gotten the recognition. Well, yes, I, it was accessible yeah. in, in both lineages. Absolutely. And, uh, and still now I could go and, and, and study and stay at the center with the Tolku yeah. and, and go through all of those yes. things. Um, <laughs> Master Sayyik himself has uh, traveled to sit with his holiness along with his teacher. The Dalai Lama yes. is what she's referring to. And so these things are all related. One is not better than the other. It is all it is all of one piece. Um, but just because they were thinking that, yes, okay, we, we believe that this is this person, that doesn't mean that I'm going to necessarily be able to meet this criteria going forward to be able to do what needs done. And now also to clarify something else, I am not the female head of the Jaguar. That is oh, not, okay, so what, I am Zakulu Ishbalam, the uh, white earth jaguar woman. Yeah. There are four couples on this earth plane right now, each assigned to a direction. Master and I are in the direction of the north. So we are the primary in the north. It's not over everything. It's like being part of a council, which we are that as sure, well. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so it's it's not like the pinnacle of, of pinnacles, but yes, it is. It is and it is and it isn't. Yeah. Here <laughs> and now, um, there are some things that I am recognized as that I don't even really talk about, like being clan mother. I'm the acting clan mother. There are certain things, you know, timekeeper. I'm an acting timekeeper. But it's not like I have been in this so long and have awakened into this ancient knowledge so much that I remember everything or that they can allow me to do certain things yet. Um, and in that regard, it's important to know that just because one person in the lineage, let's say master, is, is feeling as though I am this person, it must go through a lot of different fail safes. In this case, it was pretty straightforward. So why don't you jump into that? So now you fly out to Kansas, and you're with these people who are hoping that you are their girl. And so you have to throw the bones. You have, they, they put you through the ringer. They put you through a lot of tests. Can, can you tell us about that? Well, one of the most, um, 
most important things at first was just seeing if I was going to be able to match master's vibration. If I am his match, then I should be able to do that. So when I first rolled the bones, I did not even know how to read them. Of course I do now and because- can you describe what they look like? Cause I, you know, rolling the bones, throwing the stones. Can you describe what they look like to everyone? Well, and of course, many cultures do this. Mm -hmm. Um, many lineages do this, uh, even specifically with bones. These bones are the bones of the Monik, the deer. They are part of her foot. You think that's just a, you know, it's just solid, a hoof like a horse. It's not. There are moving parts <laughs> in there, and she has small bones inside there. These are the bones that are used. Um, you know, they, they go through, of course, the blessing process, so on and so forth. And then they are numbered from one to 20. There are 20 bones. And each number corresponds to a vibration on the Zulkan sacred count, the Mayan calendar. When Master threw the bones, I had no idea what his final number was because I didn't understand how to read them. I also didn't know what I threw, but I surely remember his reaction or his response after I had rolled. I mean, you know, Master, he is rarely rendered speechless. And he just sat there and he just kept looking and he would look at me and he would look at the bones and he would just sit and think. Long story short, Master's role at that time was 15. 15 corresponds to the men, the winged ones. They are the ones that carry the messages back and forth into the etheric to creator, however you want to, uh, <laughs> however you want to express that. And it also turns out that I rolled 15, just like master. And when uh, the numerology was done for my birth date, it was also my birth number. It has to do with communication, messages coming and going, these, these kinds of these kinds of things. Um, and of course, we all have different gifts and that, that is one of mine. But the fact is I, I matched his vibration and no one else had ever done that. There are others that could have had the capacity to do what I am now doing, but they were not me. They could stand in for me, but they were not me. As you pointed out, we have found one another throughout history so that we could do this work and continue it. And so it creates a whole different dynamic. It's not that certain things can't be done, especially if the person can hold a vibration that is required. But because it's me and because master is holding certain information that belongs to me specifically, it's very, very important that we join up because there are certain things that cannot be done unless you have both pieces of information. It's like, you know, putting a key in a lock, yeah. literally, oh, yeah. literally. Uh, we were involved with the circles of power. Um, certain things had to occur with that. You have to have your heart in the right place. You go through tests to make sure that you are going to be not only serious, but be able to endure what is required of you, that intestinal fortitude. And one of the things that we look at when we read people, and uh, we do have a student in common, and um, this particular one student has had a reading recently of things that can be viewed on the feet, the tops and bottoms of the feet, around the ankles, these types of things. And we read both her and her husband. And it was quite revelatory. You know, we can, we can find a lot out about people like this. So of course, they're examining those things, certain things that I have on my body coordinate with what this particular person it happens to be me, but has on their body. And so the fact that I had these markings 
and could go through this process and be able to pass all the tests, even though they knew basically from what I have heard at a glance, you know, at a first interaction, um, the, the, all these protocols had to be gone through. And you may ask, why am I sitting here in more of a Western guise? Maybe I don't appear to be particularly Mayan. We must understand that many of us are here in a particular guise in this space, place, and time for a reason, to be a bridge, right? What good is it if you show up Mayan in this lifetime? I mean, I'm, I, I apologize. If I show up Mayan in this right. lifetime and you show up Tibetan in this lifetime. Right. Or Nepali. Nepali, all, Nepali, all of this. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. it does mm -hmm. not bring across the same changes. We don't have access to the same things. So there are reasons why all of this is. We've all been in many different guises and we've, we've appeared in a lot of different forms just here on this earth plane alone. And um, I was concerned about this at first and I, I asked um, not only master, but also one of the indigenous grandmothers that I study with, Grandmother Nape of the Lakota. And they both say, if anyone has any question, if they are feeling as though there's even the slightest amount of ambiguity, refer them to the elders and the elders care of it. It is not me saying that I am anything. I am here to serve. I'm here to serve my brothers and sisters. It is not about me at all. It's about certain energies, certain vibrations coming together in order to facilitate certain types of change and to build upon things that must have an expansion in order for us to get to where we need to go, particularly Yes, and you know, and I, I want to take that, you know, a little step further, but I do want to kind of wrap up the story where she did pass all the exams, obviously, and then came back. I'm still passing them. <laughs> still passing them. And now, uh, you They're know, still going on. <laughs> and so she came back, you know, to, to, to Pennsylvania and Master Zaiq moved to, you know, the area that, that Ginger and I live in. <clears throat> Where where they 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 live together and they teach classes and they live happily ever ever after. But I want to get to a point and we kind of discussed this before we we started recording, which was <clears throat> yes you are here to serve in a certain capacity. But in order for you to actually serve in that capacity, you needed the recognition because that you know I call it the driver's license. It gives you it gives you the authority. It gives you the authentication so that you can you can be at a higher level of service and for women you know especially western women it's hard to to get recognized as a reincarnation or you know to 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 get to your level and and ginger is a living and breathing woman who in my opinion you know she's breaking that glass ceiling for more women to follow in her footsteps and then after she is gone and she's no longer on this planet, a whole new generation of women will be able to step into um, leadership roles in these ancient traditions. And the Mayan tradition is very special in my opinion, because the women are the leaders. You know, they, you know, Master Zayit told me, you know, you don't introduce me before Ginger. She, she, she is the lead. She's the woman, the woman is the head. You introduce her first because it's all about the female. That's unusual. And, you know. In Western society, it is. Indigenous yes. society, in large measure, it is not. There's been quite a bit of continuity with that, but yet <laughs> there's been yeah. some deviation from that as well. And so it's the reawakening of that into that matrilineal um, situation, you know. Um, which is why you're doing it in a Western body, because it is not that way in the West. Well, and that's and that's a and very good point. Feel, that's another reason yeah. why. Uh, also, we should touch upon what is the difference between being adopted, 
into mm -hmm. a tribe or a clan or something like that and being recognized. Yes. Because, you know, I wouldn't say anyone, but a lot of folks with right heart mind, if they are studying with indigenous people, perhaps at some point they may be adopted. They may have an indigenous name. I am not adopted. I am recognized. The difference in that is, it's like we already know you. We recognize you. We have been waiting for you. We have been watching <laughs> to see, you know, when this is going to occur, when this, this is going to come to light, so to speak. Of course, everything is in divine order. But when that happened formally, then a formal announcement is made. And not just of the Jaguar clan. Um, we have the same as many cultures. I hesitate to call it a hierarchy. However, there's a certain structure. And within that structure, there are houses. We belong to two particular houses. So the recognition also had to come through that. Mm -hmm. That is related more into that, that high council and these kinds of things. So there are many levels to this. Right here on this earth plane, we're in the, you know, we're in this the Jaguar lineage, we're in the Jaguar clan of the North. And that is primary. However, there is this whole other sort of um, council and hierarchy that must approve, must be able to see certain things in order to give this. It is not anything that is arbitrary by any means. And it's also not easy. It was a huge decision to do it, but I knew that I needed to. I had the right to refuse. However, if we ex accept it, we must continue and we must fulfill what we have um, agreed to do. And if we do not, it will not turn out very well for us. That makes sense. So, oh. yeah, we give our basically, right. we give our word, we give our, right. our, our body, mind, soul, spirit, and everything over to, over to the work. So now she is recognized and, and an actual letter did go out to, to all the clans to, to announce her. So now once that happens, then will you ever be adopted or is that just not necessary anymore? Oh, no, that it's kind of like, okay, um, let's see, how can I, how can I quantify that? It would be like you joined a Sangha, Lisa, and you go there regularly. The difference between that and you being in your llama studies. I mean, it's just dramatic. Okay. Anybody, anybody can be, be adopted if they, okay. if they have been in service in some oh, way. Okay. But the recognition. The recognition <laughs> is something entirely different. I As you it. would say, I am very old. Some days I feel like it. But, but, but as far as lifetimes go, yeah. You know, yeah. people are like, oh, I'm an old soul. Well, you know, a lot of, a lot of us are. <laughs> yeah, most people are, but some are older than yeah. others. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you, if you have that kind of experience and in other lifetimes, you have in whatever lineage it is, it doesn't have to be indigenous, it doesn't have to be Mayan, you know, but you have followed a path of the heart, a path mm -hmm. of service, and you have had a spiritual life, these kinds of things, then it stands to reason the older you are, the more success you have, have had, the more karma you've been able to burn, these kinds of things. Um, and so you, you can arrive at this type of a juncture then when you come in. Yeah. Doesn't mean that I'm going to follow that in my life. Maybe I decide I don't want that kind of life. And then it, everything just cycles around and you know, certain things that would have been able to happen just won't happen, not only with the individual themselves, but also um, in large measure, everybody that they come in contact to and you know, 
all of this, the energies at play. So how, how did this recognition change your life, your, your social life, your, your spiritual life? And, um, you know, cause you, you completely, you know, you left Tibetan Buddhism and you went into it. You had to start all over again. <laughs> well, yeah, yes and no. But you know, she has the past lives, but you in this body, you have to start all over with your learning again and trying to, you know, and embody these teachings to hope maybe, you know, re reawaken some some memories within you. But this physical body, you know, has not studied the Mayan before. And and so in a sense, you you had to work really hard. So how did that change your life? In, in a way, yes, and in a way, no. Um, lineages that are of a certain level will always have similarities because there is no separation. It's just being able to learn that language, mm -hmm. learn the ins and outs of how it works specifically in the Mayan world, um, in the indigenous world at large, which I, being part of that anyway, um, some of that already existed, but it's a whole new field of study. And I don't leave any of my other lineages behind. They are all still within me. In fact, you and I had both studied the mystical Kabbalah for some time. Yeah. I utilize mystical yeah. Kabbalah today with yeah. students. Yeah. There was something that was applicable and that is perfectly all right because it's what is needed. That is why uh, master's teachers also sent him around the world to study so that he can be well-rounded and understand how all of these things relate. I went from being involved in a lot of social justice work and um, teaching a lot of yoga and and um, these kinds of things to really being much more in seclusion, which was very handy when it came to came to to COVID, which is no joke. But that wasn't especially difficult for me because I was already in retreat, so to speak. Now that um, there are more students and uh, things have opened more, and as I evolve through all of this. It does change some. I mean, there's a bit more socialization to be had. You and I are sitting here doing the show, which is really, really beautiful. Um, but also other things fall away. And they must, because as you know, Lisa, there's only there's only so many hours in the day. Now there's allowing time to take us just being in the flow and then that goes much easier. But really we must choose where we are going to focus our energy, our time, our mind, our heart. And so once you make that decision, you do. You, you allow other things to fall away that are not necessary, are not needed what it is that you are doing now and that is okay and, and, and be, because we are close I know a lot of falling away oh yeah oh yeah it really did <laughs> layer after layer after layer and that to me that's why to me it feels like you're starting over because you're you're letting go of so much so you can embrace you know, that, that new, that, that that's just so essential. So what, what was it like to begin new, new studies, new practices? Oh my, it, it was truly a whole new world. And yet it wasn't new. Everything made so much sense to me. And then yet other things, I was very <laughs> apprehensive about embracing because I wasn't sure that I could get on board with it because that, but that was because I didn't understand it at the time. So some things came easier than others. The further I got though, particularly into the Zulkin sacred count and also ritual and ceremony with master arcana, these kinds of things, 
the more I had a capacity to be able to just simply allow those things to fall away that needed to. Of course, we're always going around in that spiral. There's always more. Um, but now we welcome it. Where as beings that are just starting out on the spiritual path, often we are so resistant. It doesn't mean that I'm still not resistant in some ways. And um, leaning in to balance and harmony more and more, but it's out of necessity. I literally, and it's, and it's in such stark relief, as you know, as your discernment increases, you're like, oh my word, you know, always it's ourselves holding ourselves back, but we can see it so much more clearly and it becomes imperative for us to be able to let go of certain things, not just, you know, things that we used to include in our life, but also patterns, behavior, modes of being, all of these, because we know that it's not helping our process of awakening fully into who and what we truly are. And that's true of anyone. You don't have to be recognized. You know, as long as you're, as long as you're on the path, <laughs> you're yes. going to encounter that. So do you participate in the council meetings? At present, I do not, in the context of communicating with the other council members directly, it is through master mm -hmm. that I do that. They can view me through his eyes. I've given permission for that. And I receive transmissions, messages, visions, different things like that from them. I'm also given responsibility, as you said, in a lot of cases, it's up to the clan mothers, the grandmothers to make certain decisions. The final decision for a lot of things falls to me. And that's physical. That's so that's the last word. Like basically, yeah. even if master says, well, I think this, if I say absolutely not, it's not happening. Like a physical decision. An absolute that's decision good. Good. now that is concerning students, right? For example, right? And it's not that master and I don't have a very healthy interaction and dynamic and things, but he will always say, particularly if it has to do with the student or someone else and it's a decision that has to be made, he'll say, I may, I may be not for this, but maybe she is. And she has the last word or vice versa. Right. But we give each other good counsel in regard to those things. But there is some communication that I do not do um, with counsel at this time. However, I do have, um, I have access to them through master, also through prayer and ceremony. And here on this plane, as I mentioned earlier, I do have teachers there, usually the grandmothers, not always. If there's something that I have a query about, I can go to one of them for, for insight, for interpretation. And they also come to me, even the ones who are, are older than I am. Because we teach each other, we enhance each other's understanding and interpretation of all sorts of things. And the reason that we must do that on this plane and continue to do it, and you and I also, you know, we don't do as much of that as we would like to, and as we used to, simply because of our, you know, um, structure of how we're working. Um, I'm not all about busyness, but we are really dedicated to these kinds of things. And we have a lot more clarity on things than what we used to. And we used to confer, confer a lot more, but we have each other to do that. There is a huge circle of women here on this earth plane that are doing that. Now, I am on the cusp to move into the next 
circle of power. And when I do that, then I will be able to go more direct. And there are reasons why I haven't been able to do that yet. And that is okay because life is not linear. No, it's not. <laughs> but when, when you, I have two questions. Okay. So the first one, this circle of power, is this an energetic etheric? Or is this like physical people? The circle of power is in all dimensions. So primarily here, but in communication with other dimensions. Right, but they are physical people that represent that circle of power. Well, I okay, what I understand you are interpreting as a circle of power, there you know, that that may be counsel. But what I'm talking about circle of power is something different. Okay. So it's it's more like a, you know, a fair um, energetic circle of power that, that you, your energy steps into that quality. It will, but I must <laughs> physically be outside in a circle of power. Like I was in Kansas. I went outside. I had to create the structure of the circle. Yeah. Can you go I, over that? Because people aren't going to understand that. I'm well, not, briefly, because that's briefly. not no, public no, information no, necessarily. No, don't don't, don't um, disclose we don't, oh, want, no, we, 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 we don't want that you negative make karma. Me. <laughs> we don't want that negative karma. Just just as much as you can give us a physical, you know, sure. what 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 is the physical, you know, uh, circle of power, and then energetically you have to equal that. So what happens if we're going to go into the circle? Is we do create a physical circle on the earth. Think of a humblekia, a vision quest, and they. Uh, the the film Dreamkeeper is wonderful if you've ever seen it. And in it, one of the characters is sent up on the mountain for a vision quest. And he is told not to leave the circle. You do not leave the circle until your work is concluded. But it is a physical circle on the earth that you will sit in for a certain amount of time. And there are many, many things happening in there. You have certain items in there with you in each direction, but you are, once you enter the circle, you are in that circle until certain things take place. But what it does is it opens a doorway between you, like we were talking about, portals, things yeah. like that. It's literally a portal. You have that circle of power that you are sitting in on Mother Earth. However, it is open in other dimensions. Okay. Yeah. So you you can communicate and interact in that way. That you know you can hear and see yeah. things and some of them mm -hmm. will be inside. They will be on your mind screen. Some of them will not. You will see with your physical eyes or even be able to touch at certain times with your physical body, things that will come to you as a result of the work that you are doing in this circle. In fact, close to the closing of the first circle of power, there was an animal that showed up and came from a certain direction and had certain types of behaviors that was, would not have been there had I not been there doing that. Let's just say that. Yeah, that and I sense. have since understood who that was and why they came and so on and so forth. Um, but it, the circle of power is literally a circle on this plane, but it is also on other in other dimensions and continuing i am still in the second circle of power right now because there are certain things that i must complete it's like a launching in yeah. so so i was able to step out of of the physical circle of power and then finish whatever work that i needed to do in order to complete that fully before I could move into the second one. I'm getting ready to bring the second one to a close and then that will open the third. So now when you open the third, do you have to create, you know, a physical circle on the earth that represents the energy of the third 
and step into that and then do your ceremony and your thing that you do for the third circle of power? I may or may not. It, it's, <laughs> it's unclear to me right now, but certain things are being facilitated on the land where we are staying to help with these kinds of things, to create a certain energetic balance in an area of balance of the elements. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in order to create an environment in which these things can ripen and more easily take place. Okay. So I may very well go out and sit in that when I launch into that, but there's going to be a lot of other things that will happen as well. Well, I look forward to hearing about that. <laughs> so my my next question is you you and master are the representatives of the Mayan tradition, the Jaguar lineage of the North. So, and you're a physical representative of that. So are there physical representatives of the East and the South and the West as well? All, all directions. And there, so I, am, and, I am one of four women on, and, the, and on the earth, yeah. the physical earth right now doing this. So ha have you talked to the other three women? I know who two of them are, but I do not communicate with them at this time. That would be so powerful for all four of you, you know, to even if it was just through Zoom, you know, just private, that all four of you could, could actually connect. Um, oh my gosh, it would be like bringing crystal skulls together. I mean, the... <laughs> The, the explosion of that energy would just be absolutely amazing. So the um, is, is the Jaguar, the North and then the South is a different um, lineage or, or are you just all four directions of, of the Jaguar lineage? It's predominantly four directions of the Jaguar lineage, mm -hmm. although everyone is coming from their own background. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, one of the masters that Master Saik studied with comes from the highlands of Scotland. And so you would think, oh, how is this person Jaguar? But they are the energetics of it's that. The energetic is not. Right. And I'm not also related to, yeah. you know, we are, and so is Master. He looks Mayan, but he's also related to, you know, to that lineage. So and you would think, well, then why are we not communicating? We are communicating, but we're not communicating like you and I are communicating or like we're communicating with your audience. Right. Um, we are all connected and we are all doing our work, but a lot of it tends to be very sequestered. We go out at times, other times, no. They don't always know where each other even is. It's much easier to communicate, and you know this very well, um, energetically than it is in the physical. And if you can do it energetically, like why do you need to do it in the physical necessarily? Although at times we do have a longing to, to join together, and we do do that at times. However, it has not happened since I have stepped into this. And a lot of that has to do with a lot of travel restrictions and so on and so forth. So that's the quick answer. Well, that's a great answer, you know, because that's that's one thing that I would like to talk about is that you know we we are color, creed, denomination, nationality. You know, um, my my teachers always say, you know, my my lineage is born. Born is not does not belong to Tibet. It belongs to no one, and it belongs to everyone. It's not just a culture. You know, most most people um, would would look at me, yeah, and say, well, why why aren't you Nepalese? Why aren't you Tibetan? You you can't be doing what you're doing because you're not part of the culture. It's like no, it's because it's not a culture. You know, it's a vibration. It's an energy, and, and mine mine is is no different. And I think, you know, you you are bringing that message home by being a Western woman that you're showing that these, these indigenous lineages that we so greatly need their teachings are beyond form and color and denomination. They, they are energies and they, they are each individual vibrations that, you know, 
by by us doing what we're doing as Western women, we're we're breaking that mold. You know, we're breaking that glass ce ceiling. We're bringing in a whole new way of thinking that that's moving away from nationality because it is a vibration. Um, and I think that's a beautiful thing. And it's not appropriation. We have to be very careful here. There are a lot of people, oh, you know, I'm this or I'm that, or I would like to be this, I'd like to be that, I'd like to learn cacao ceremony, I would, you know, this, that, and the other ceremony, and, you know, my teacher was from here, and I'm allowed to do it, and everything, and they have just mm -hmm. part of the information. You know, they're really not set up to be running certain types of ceremony. Um, so we really do have to understand that. Uh, fortunately for me, I did have that continuous thread. I knew I had indigenous heritage, but in my grandmother's time, it was not spoken of. It was something that was hidden and they did that for a reason. And so that has left a lot of us with indigenous heritage very untethered, unless you are physically born on the reservation yeah. in a lot of cases, or you are raised traditionally and in some ways I was when I look back on it and I see the kinds of things that my grandmother taught and that my mother taught um they were indigenous teachings however it was not formal and so understanding that um you would wonder well if I had indigenous heritage wouldn't I figure out you know what tribe or what clan I, I really was, you know, more directly instead of ending up in this Mayan Jaguar clan. Well, when I inquired with the grandmother, as we call her, my mother and I call her that because she is one of our grandmothers from way back, a medicine person who come to us. I asked her, why do you keep sending me to the And she said, basically because they are the closest living in the traditional manner still. They still have all of the things in place that are needed in order to really get in depth with all of this. And most people understand the situation with the indigenous here in the United States, and it is not a good one. It doesn't mean that there are not wonderful traditions being upheld, but it's all about going to the root, which I have always done. And this is where I was to be. You're, you know, and I've never asked you this, but I know you're very connected to the um, Native Americans and, and, in the United States with, with the Indian clans, which ones, you know, are, are you, do you feel the closest connection to? Well, that's very interesting. There, there are a few. Um, one of the particular ones that is close to my heart, and I've mentioned Grandmother Nape twice before, her ears must be ringing right now. <laughs> of the Lakota, I feel very, very connected with her as a sister. Um, and I have felt connected to them in, in many ways over the years, but that's not all. I also feel connection to other tribal peoples that I learned later were actually related to the Maya because as Master was pointing out, you know, the, the migration and all of these kinds of things. And so there's a lot there. I'm looking forward to getting back to the Southwest uh, as well in order to commune with folks there. But we're everywhere. <laughs> we are literally everywhere. But I have had the good fortune to have some teachers come through, indigenous teachers come through me in visions, teaching very particular types of things and doing, you know, energy transference and, and, and this sort of thing um, from multiple tribal histories. Okay. And then 
I, I have um, another question and we'll, sure. we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up. But Ginger and I, her, her mother um, is like a mom to me. I, I call her Mama Emma. Uh, she was my, you know, her and Mary Pat, you know, were, were our, our first healing teachers that were so grateful to Emma Newman and Mary Pat Fitzgibbons, you know, at the um, Appalachian Institute of Awakening. We, we were fortunate enough to go to a real accredited school here in little central Pennsylvania, led by Ginger's mom. And so she, she gave us indigenous training. She gave us she was also, um, I, most people know this story. She, she was a Lutheran nun who wanted to be a minister and they wouldn't ordain her because she was a woman. So she went out on her own and she got her ordination. So she also gave us Christian training, uh, Indian training. Oh my gosh, I just can't remember all of the different lineages, but she, she loaded us up, but she really spent a lot of time. And I have the book over there on my shelf. And I, oh my gosh, oh. I, I start, oh, here it comes. The tears come when I just say the word silver birch. Um, she, she had us uh, read the book. My, my, my book has underlines all over it from the teachings of, of silver birch that um, they changed my life. I had, you know, face-to-face -face experiences with him. And, but I don't know what tribe he was from I don't know any information about that so can you can you kind of enlighten people and tell tell people about Sobel Birch because he there there's a book there there is there's books that you can read that are absolutely just amazing there there was a being that came through someone many years back <clears throat> and uh spoke through this individual. And this being that came through decided to come in the guise of a Native American Indian or whatever they deemed it as. I had to pick something. And that that is what that being chose. They also chose that for a reason. It doesn't necessarily mean that Silver Birch wasn't actually an actual walking, talking indigenous person here on this earth plan at one point. But that was the guys they chose. And isn't that interesting? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and those teachings transcended indigenous culture. It, it 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 was an all-encompassing type of teaching so it went further in other words like i'm talking about jaguar clan but yet there's a council and there's this and there's that it's the same it's the same thing you know energetically silver birch was connected you know all the way through but had to um dilute itself down not just energetically in order to come through this person, um, but also to be able to make a choice and how they were going to present themselves, how they were going to look. And here we are in this space, place and time, still talking about silver birch and all of that wisdom and that he was here in this form. At that time, when it actually happened, our indigenous people were even in a, a more precarious state. They were not being viewed as anyone that had any wisdom in large measure. So that was also done on purpose. So just because we show up as an indigenous teacher at one time doesn't mean that we're going to be that at another time, but it does mean that there's a there's this common thread energetically that's going to come through and we make a choice as you know yeah. well thank you i think i think we'll end here on on silver birch and then we'll we'll find another topic for us to talk about we'll 
do a part two? Probably not because I know our schedules and then now we're getting into Thanksgiving and we're getting into Christmas and then probably, you know, we'll, we'll get together sometime in the uh, beginning of 2022. Um, and it then, sounds and great. Then, There'll be lots more. That seemed like a lot of housekeeping. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather, I'd rather uh, um, talk about the work and, and, um, you know, what it all, what it all means and, and uh, what we can be doing right here on exactly. this plane in order to help to facilitate that's all of these about. changes that are needed because it all starts. Yes, that's what it's all about. And that, that's what we'll discuss in part two in 2020, part two in 2022. <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining us. Namaste, Tashi Delay, so much love, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Mwah. Oh, my, oh my. Journey well. <laughs> Journey well. Bye-bye.